Hi folks, Wooden Boat Dan here. Just wanted to give you a heads up. The podcast you're about to listen to was recorded several years ago. So some of the phone numbers, email addresses, website, links, and time-sensitive information are no longer valid. Please keep that in mind as you listen. If you'd like to contact me, my email address is woodenboatdan at gmail.com. Thank you and enjoy the podcast. Welcome to Hooked on Wooden Boats, weekly podcast episode number 92. I'm your host, Dan Matson, a.k.a. Wooden Boat Dan. If he can't do it, well, he's probably doing some research to figure out how he can. (laughs) And this is the world's first podcast, fully 150% dedicated to celebrating the art, craft, history, tradition, and romance of wooden vessels around the world, the universe, and extraterrestrial places. I didn't say that right. Extraterrestrial places. If they exist there, maybe there's wooden boats on Mars. I don't know. And they've got some great construction method. Anyway, welcome to the podcast today. Great to have you on board. We've got an action-packed episode as usual. And I'm very excited today to announce that the featured segment is with Matt Murphy, who is the editor of Wooden Boat Magazine. Uh, He's been at Wooden Boat Magazine about 20 years. And Matt and I are going to be talking about the upcoming Wooden Boat Show in Mystic Seaport, Connecticut, uh, June 28th, 29th, and 30th, 2013. Uh, We're going to talk about the highlights coming up for that show and also get a little personal history on Matt. It's going to be a lot of fun, so stick around for that interview in a couple minutes here. So this past week has been a whirlwind (laughs) A absolute, an absolute whirlwind of wooden boat activity for Wooden Boat Dan. First of all, on Saturday, June 15th, I attended the second biannual Wooden Boat Festival at Bainbridge Island, Washington. It's a festival of about 40 to 50 boats, uh, very personal. It was a lot of fun. There was really some cool boats there. I got to do a couple interviews. One with George Fisher, who has a 30-square-meter sailboat that was built in Sweden in 1937. And another one with Scott Sprague, who's got a 40-foot, 40 or 41-foot sailboat, a double-ended sailboat that he designed and built himself over an eight-year period. The show was a lot of fun. I got to hook up with some people that I've met before. And also got to meet a couple new people that I have emailed with but never met in person. So it was really a lot of fun. Spent the whole day over there, took a ton of pictures, some of which will probably end up on my wooden boat calendar for 2014. So that was how the weekend started on Saturday. Then on Sunday, we launched the 11-foot canoe that I've been building. Yay, it's done! (laughs) Oh my goodness, I... uh, Switched for the last coat of varnish to Epiphanes, and that worked really well. So I was happy with the varnish. I would give it, on a scale of 1 to 10, the varnish job I would give between a 7 and an 8. So it's not perfect, but it was at a 5 to 6, going about 5 or 6 coats into it. So that last coat made it look really nice. So on Sunday, with four of my five boys and my wife, We carried the boat down to Lake Kai, which is about a block and a half from my house here in Arlington, Washington. And we christened the boat, put her in the water, paddled her around. She handles great. It was really fun. It's very exciting to get the boat in the water finally. She weighs in at 32 pounds, 11 feet long, lap strake boat. I spent a total of 138 hours on building her. And I should mention that probably, I've got to go back and do the math, but actually of the 138 hours, maybe a third of that was in finishing the boat. Seriously, epoxy coating, sanding, priming, painting, varnishing. Did I mention sanding? So that's a huge part of it. But anyway, she came out beautiful, uh, spent about $600 building her. 
So I saved quite a bit over the kit price, which I think is eight or nine hundred dollars from CLC boats, something like that. Maybe it's seven hundred. So I saved a little bit of money, not a lot, but uh, it was a great experience. Really cool boat. If you'd like to see a video of the christening, it's about two minutes long. Go to hookedonwoodenboats.com forward slash Chelan, which is spelled C-H-E-L-A-N. And that's the name that we gave the boat. Lake Chelan is a beautiful lake in eastern Washington that we've camped at for years. It's a deep water lake, which is um, Native American for Chelan is deep water. So we thought that was a very fitting name for the boat. So she's called Chelan. So go check it out, hookedonwoodenboats.com forward slash Chelan. The other thing is I got quite a bit of work done on the scamp this week. Uh, I'm working on the scamp kit. What I'm doing is pre-coating the parts before I assemble them with three coats of epoxy. So I put the first coat on, let it cure, sand it because the first coat gets real rough. It kind of raises the grain. And then I add two more coats of epoxy after that. And if I add them about six to eight hours apart, I don't have to clean for the amine blush. So I'm working on that. I've got about 17 and a half hours into the scamp and have spent $3,481 so far. And you can track the progress I'm keeping uh, on my website. If you go to hookedonwoodenboats.com forward slash scamp, I'm tracking on there my exact hours to do the build and my exact cost. And then I'm putting some tips as I go along of things that are helping to make the build a little bit easier. So I'm keeping a very detailed log, and I'm hoping this will be beneficial to other folks in the future that are going to build a scamp, that maybe they can kind of see, look at this and say, okay, here's about how long it's going to take, here's how much it might cost, here's some ideas on how to make the build go smoothly. So anyway, check it out, hookedonwoodenboats.com forward slash scamp. The other really fun thing is I love kind of recycling, finding free stuff or used stuff for cheap that I can use. So I needed 18 pounds of lead weight for the centerboard of the scamp. And I could have bought a 25-pound bag of lead shot from Cabela's for $44. That was one option. I could have bought some sheet lead for $30 to $50 on the Internet. But I went to Craigslist instead, and I got creative. And I saw a lady that was selling ankle weights on Craigslist, which have basically lead shot in them. They're they're workout weights you put around your ankles when you walk or whatever. So I emailed her and said, I need 18 pounds of weight. I don't care what the outside of the ankle weight looks like. Uh, So she emailed back and said, you know, I've got some ankle weights that the Velcro's broken or something wrong with the outside. Anyway, I'll sell you 20 pounds worth of those for $15. (laughs) So I met her yesterday at a a hardware store in Woodenville, Washington, while I was out doing some errands, and picked up an assortment of ankle weights that weigh actually almost 25 pounds. So now I'll cut those open, take the lead shot out, and use those to epoxy into my centerboard. So that's pretty cool. I saved some money, and it's a creative way of recycling something. So that's the update on the scamp. This week we've got four new subscribers to the e-newsletter. Mark Gamel, George Fisher, Scott Sprague, and Julie Vandershagen. Thanks for subscribing. If you haven't subscribed yet, I send out a monthly newsletter. And I'm due for the month of June here. I'm going to get it out this week. The newsletter is just an update on what I'm up to some resources, links to videos, new information from Hooked on Wooden Boats. It's just kind of a fun way to connect with people. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please go to hookedonwoodenboats.com forward slash subscribe and sign up for the e-newsletter. Okay, I want to back up just for a second a couple more things on my canoe that I'm doing is I'm building a cart for the canoe, which is actually a couple lawnmower wheels on a piece of wood with a couple rails, and I'll strap it to that and be able to roll it around. And I got the plans from that from CLC Boats. I'm going to include the links and uh, link to those plans in the show notes because they're really simple. I was able to basically, the only thing I had to buy was $10 worth of, uh, well, I got to buy a strap. So I'll spend about $20 
to make this really nice cart so that one person can just roll this thing around really easily. And I'm also going to put handles on each end of the boat that will hang, that will be on a little uh, rope loop, or loop of rope, however you say that. And there'll be mahogany handles that will be varnished. Also got the plans for those off of CLC boats. I will include the link there. So check it out. Uh, go to the show notes for today's podcast, and you'll see the links there uh, partway down on the page for episode 92. Okay, we're going to move on to the interview with Matt Murphy from Wooden Boat Magazine. Take it away, Matt. Okay, I have on the phone with me Matt Murphy, editor of Wooden Boat Magazine. Matt, welcome to the podcast today. Thank you, Dan. Good to have you on board. Uh, we're talking via phone here. And uh, Matt, you're in Brooklyn, Maine, I understand. Uh, yes, I am. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. So, Matt, let's start... Uh, we're going to eventually talk about the Wooden Boat Show in Mystic coming up here in a week or so and uh, that sort of thing. But let's start with a little personal history about you. Why don't you tell me about yourself, where you're from, and what you did growing up? Uh, well, I'm from Salem, Massachusetts, and uh, I, I played in boat summers growing up and thought about them winters growing up. And uh, I, I grew up um, sailing a, a number of one design sloops um, in the Marblehead area, including Rhodes 19s, Hetchel's 22s, Town Class. Um, and uh, sometime around the age of 14 or 15, I picked up a copy of this magazine called Wooden Boat and, um, and haven't put it down since. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, did your family do a lot of boating as a kid then? Uh, they did. Uh, my folks had a... Um, my my dad grew up in power boats, but when I was ten or eleven, he bought a sailboat, a wooden Choi Lee Lion, which was a, a uh, an Arthur Robb design, a thirty six foot T culled sloop, and that sort of sent me off on the the sailing trajectory. He came back to power boats a few years later, um, and I always enjoyed those, but um, but really sailing became my passion then. Uh, and he had a after that boat uh, years later. A, a wooden Grand Banks, uh, a 36-foot Grand Banks. Oh, wow. It was a family boat. Mm-hmm. So a teak hulled boat, that's a little bit unusual. I haven't heard of that before. Well, the, the Toy Lees were, and um, you know, I can't tell you much about the economies of the time they were built, um, except that I think it was a pretty favorable situation and something that wouldn't happen now. Um, yeah, because I guess they, teak was readily, more readily available then, or? Right, and they were a production boat. They were teak planked. Um, the frames were, I think, yackled, but I, I can't say for sure. But I do know this boat had a. Um, th- these were things I couldn't appreciate when I was ten or eleven. But it was, as I said, teak hulled, bronze fastened, and had an iron keel, which, um, you know, that that's. Uh, and I believe it had iron floor timbers, and that's often a, a recipe for, for at least a short life. And um, I know the garboards were were. Um, taken off for inspection of this boat about five or six years ago, and the rabbit was perfect, and the, the structure was perfect, the builder reported. Wow. It was quite a testament to a boat of that age, built in the early 60s. Yeah, yeah. So, Matt, have you, did you build any boats as a kid? Um, sometime, when did I do this? In college, I guess, I built my first boat from the pages of Wooden Boat. It was the, um, the 22-foot Kingfisher rowing shell. And um, I followed that up with a, um, a strip planked kayak and um, a, a dinghy. And uh, I haven't built any large boats, but when I was in grad school, I, I did a lot of uh, repair on larger wooden yachts. Mm-hmm. But I haven't um, haven't been involved in any any large boat construction. So, what was the construction method of that rowing shell you built when you were that a kid? That was plywood uh, designed oh, by. Yeah, designed by a um, uh, an Australian um, uh, who had moved to Putney, Vermont, uh, Graham King, and um, was uh, is one of the leading wooden shell builders in the country. And this was before I worked for the magazine, but Wooden Boat had commissioned him to design a boat um, specifically for a how-to and for for uh, home construction. And so it it really combined elements of a a, um, a, a fast racing shell with um, a, a fairly, if not easily, uh, readily built um, plywood boat. And it was 
wonderfully detailed. Uh, I had the three issues of the magazine that had appeared in open in the shop at all times, and uh, and Graham was available on the phone pretty regularly. I I called him several times when I hit snags, and um, it was a great experience. Wow! Still have the boat. Yeah. Oh, do you really? I do. Yeah. Nice. How long is it? You say? It's twenty-two feet. Twenty-two feet. And what's the yeah. beam on that boat? I don't recall, but it's um, slightly wider than a, a competition single. Yeah, so maybe 20-some inches or... Uh, exactly, 20 yeah. or 22 inches. Yeah, okay. So did you build that from a table of offsets? Did you lay it out from off table of offsets and loft it? Or? Uh, no. Um, the the bulkheads, were, uh, the, uh, the forms were dimensioned in the... Oh, I see. Plans, okay, right. Mm-hmm. They weren't full size patterns, but mm-hmm. but it was built on forms and two permanent bulkheads, and, and I uh, see. they they had accurate dimensions. Oh, okay, all right. So once you got the forms built correctly and and spaced out, then you could just plank it from there, huh? That's right. Yeah. Cool. Very cool. So, uh, so Matt, what year did you join Wooden Boat Magazine? Ah, good question. I think it was January of ninety two. January of ninety two. And uh, we were talking beforehand, and, and you love working there. And so I'm just curious how you got that job. Well, um, well, I began a story earlier, and uh, so I picked up a copy of the magazine when I was 15 and um, then went on to college and, and um, had my sights set on, on other fields and went to grad school and studied marine policy. And as I was finishing up my master's thesis and... and um, and sending out resumes, I was reading the magazine one night, and there was a classified ad for the position of associate editor at Wooden Boat. And so I um, sent my resume off and uh, uh, called for an interview, and we just had a wonderful conversation. And that was followed by a second interview and another wonderful conversation. And um, I've been there ever since. Wow. Now, did John Wilson hire you? He did, yeah. Yeah, Okay. Wow. Now, you didn't really have editorial experience, or did you at that point? No, I didn't have professional editorial experience. Um, my writing had been purely academic at that point. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Very good. So so the articles that are in Wooden Boat Magazine, those are maybe written by other people, and you edit them? Is that kind of how the process works, Matt, or...? Well, the process varies. I mean, we're, yeah. we're open to all sorts of scenarios, mm-hmm. and we, we receive many many proposals every week every month and and um we we publish a number of those every year um, and we also write a fair number of articles in house um, we have uh, two other staff editors uh, tom jackson is our senior editor and robin jettinghoff is our assistant editor and um they both do a fair amount of writing for the magazine and and contributing in other ways yeah. So do you do some traveling with your work there? I do, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, yeah, to some... Uh, <laughs> as, um, our former senior editor, Michael Bryan, said once, um, loving wooden boats and working for wooden boats, uh, wooden boat really opens doors. And that's so true. Um, I've, I've um, been to Australia, New Zealand, Hong Kong, um, all over Europe, uh, and specifically visiting wooden boat builders and wooden boat shows. Mm-hmm. Cool. And just putting together articles for the magazine and stuff like that? Or? Uh, that's right. And looking for subjects and contributors mm-hmm. uh, and photographers. Okay. Yeah. Now, are you doing any photography yourself? Yeah. I am, yeah. I, um, uh, as, um, as I can, I like to shoot for the magazine. Yeah. And, uh, Very cool. In fact, I'm just back from Michigan where I had a, a great day shooting a, um, a, a an 18-foot launch that the, the builder had designed himself, carved from a half model, and um, and that will be coming up in the small boats edition next January. Oh, fine. Or excuse me, that'll uh, uh, I misspoke there. That'll be coming up in the small boats edition in in December. It'll be on sale this December first. Okay, so a half model. That's a pretty interesting way to build a boat, isn't it? Oh, it is. Yeah, it's the uh, the traditional um, design method of of carving your hull shape from a block of wood. Yeah, and, and then cutting it into sections and measuring exactly. it and, and upscaling it, right? That's right. Cutting it into sections and tracing those sections accurately, and then then scaling it up. 
Yeah, so I met a builder here in Olympia, Washington. His name's Bob Peck, and uh, he builds all his boats from half models. And it's like he described the process to me. And I just think that's fascinating. And are they beautiful boats? Oh, they're it's, they're really cool boats. Yeah, it's sculpting in full scale. <laughs> yeah, the the uh, last boat he built is a it's a scaled down replica of an East Coast Harbor tug. Oh. And it's about 11 feet long. It's got a little diesel engine, and it's fully rigged like a tug, a full-size tug, but it's only 11 feet, so it's pretty cool. <laughs> pretty fun stuff. So so anyway, Matt, you've got the uh, 22nd annual wooden boat show coming up here at the end of June. Is that right? That's right. Okay, I'm adding this note after the fact that the dates for the Wooden Boat Show 2013, the 22nd annual show, are June 28th, 29th, and 30th, 2013. So for those of us that have not had the privilege of going to Mystic Seaport, Connecticut, can you uh, give me a little information about that first? Tell me what that's like. The seaport itself. You know? Yeah, yeah. Well, it is the... Um, uh premier maritime museum in the u.s and uh it's it's a recreated um uh, seacoast village uh, 19th century seacoast village and um, it has a number of remarkable displays including original vessels in the water um, a few static displayed vessels and uh, uh skills demonstrations and um uh, and, and other um, other related crafts and demonstrations uh, related to a, a, a traditional seacoast village. And uh, one of the remarkable things right now is the, um, the whale ship Charles W. Morgan is um, nearing the completion of a, a, um, a restoration, and it's going to be relaunched in July. And uh, but she's been on the Mystic um, uh, in the Mystic uh, the Dupont Preservation Shipyard at Mystic. Uh, for the past several years, being rebuilt. Mm -hmm. So they have a team of shipwrights there that work at the seaport, do they, on projects like that? Uh, that's right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think they, they build that team, that it, it swells and, and shrinks uh, based on what's going on at the time. Yeah. Now, is there a museum there also of boats? Oh, yes. I mean, the, the seaport is the museum. Okay, okay. So... Um, so there's bo some boats indoors and some in the water. Is that right? Or that's right. Yeah. Yes. What What do they have indoors? Is, can you give us an example? Of some of the stuff they have there. Uh, sure. They well, um, it, it's quite a range of stuff. There's a, a hall of uh, figureheads. There's a, a planetarium. Uh, there is, there's a tremendous archive of material and um, and of stored boats. Uh, they have. Um, hundreds of boats in in what's called the uh, Rossi Mill Complex that are, uh, it, it's sort of um, storage on, on display and, and open to tours. And um, and it that is really an a incredible timeline of, um, of yachting and boating history in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And they got several hundred boats in there, huh? Yeah. And then on, um, you know, specifically to your listeners and our readers, there's... Um, the, there's a small boat shed that is a, a great display of um, of Harishoff boats, and um, and there are a couple of cat boats in that that shed also, and uh, it it feels sort of like a, a church like setting, a very low light, so the um, uh, in in deference to the the um, fragile nature of the artifact, uh, but um, oh, but also um, uh, steps, so so one can stand up high and, and view into the boats. And uh, and I highly recommend that uh, who, whoever goes to Mystic find find that display, anybody listening to this podcast. Yeah, yeah. So uh, Mystic Seaport itself is open to the public pretty much year-round, is it, Matt? Or? Uh, yes, it is. Yeah. yeah, okay, very cool. So that's basically the venue for the annual wooden boat show, is that right? That's right, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and the wooden boat show brings in a um, hundred more boats. So, so we we're holding this this show, the wooden boat show, which had a um, a solid tradition before we started holding it at Mystic. Um, but so Mystic creates this incredible venue, extant venue of, of boats, into which we bring a um, hundred more boats, which are displayed both in the water and on land, 
and tents containing 140 or more vendors selling art, antiques, tools, books, and boating gear. And there's also a demonstration area that's put together by our senior editor, Tom Jackson, and that's uh, three days of demonstrations and tours led by professional shipwrights, and that covers all aspects of building and repair, uh, modern and, and, um, and more traditional techniques. And the theme of that this year is, uh, I mentioned the, the Charles W. Morgan earlier, and there are a number of small boat shops um, all around the country, really. There's uh, one in Michigan and several around New England building a fleet of whale boats to go with the new Morgan, and each one is building a specific design whale boat. Really? So those are, uh, so how, how long is the Morgan? What's the length of her? Uh, that's an excellent question, and I don't have that at my fingertips. <laughs> okay. Over 100 feet, though, right? Uh, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm online right now, and I will um, I'll, I'll look it up as we're, okay. as we're yeah. speaking. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. And she was built in 1841, and I read that she's going to be launched July 21st. That's uh, right. Mm -hmm. After this big restoration, which has taken several years, right? It has, and the plan is... Um, uh, this uh, a very ambitious and I think visionary plan to um, to to sail her next summer to Stellwagen Bank, and Stellwagen Bank is a um, a well known whale feeding ground uh, off the Massachusetts coast. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Morgan's overall length is 113 feet. 113. Okay. Now the 27 other... foot six inch beam. Okay. What's she planked with? Um, I know. believe she is. Um, I believe she's planked in oak. But again, I've got um, some restoration updates here from from Mystic. Yeah. Okay. All right. And I'd I'd like to call attention too that in um, a recent issue of Wooden Boat, Tom Jackson, our senior editor, spent um, a week working with the shipwright crew in Mystic and and wrote a a, um, a lengthy and detailed and interesting article about the project. Okay, and what magazine is that in? What uh, issue? Uh, the issue now it was um, two issues ago. It would have been, uh, I believe, two thirty-one. Two thirty-one. Okay, very cool. We'll definitely look that up. So, has the has a wooden boat show always been held in Mystic? No, uh, no, it hasn't. Um, it began in Newport, Rhode Island. Oh, really? And we had it there for several years. And our uh, plan then was to move it around every couple of years, which we did, and to great effect. But it really has found a home at Mystic Yeah. for the past eight or ten years. But the show has moved from, uh, it's been in, in Newport. Uh, we had it in St. Michael's, Maryland for a couple of years in a row. Uh, we've had it in, in South Haven, Michigan. Very cool. Yeah. So I was reading online, you're having a tribute dinner, um, which I think you have that every year. Is that right? Yes, we do. Yeah. On yeah. the Saturday night of the show. Saturday night. And uh, who are you guys giving tribute to this year? Uh, to um, Taylor Allen and Steve White. And uh, Taylor Allen is proprietor of Rockport Marine in Rockport, Maine. And Steve White is the proprietor of Brooklyn Boatyard in Brooklyn, and a neighbor of ours of the magazines in Brooklyn. Okay. Can you just tell me briefly about what those guys are up to? Sure. Well, they are two of the, the premier wooden boat yards on the East Coast and in the country, I'd say. And uh, they, um, uh, Brooklyn Boat Yard has really led the um, uh, ad advances in cold-molded construction. Uh, in fact, uh, they will have on display um, two of their W-class yachts, um, one of those being um, the uh, W76, the first one to be launched um, in the early 2000s. Uh, and Rockport Marine will be showing Bolero, uh, which is uh, one of the, the finest um, Sparkman and Stevens designs ever built. Wow. Very cool. So that's Saturday night. And then uh, I see there's a family boat building project. So what's that all about, Matt? Uh, the family boat building is a, um, a group of families uh, that get together and build 20-plus um, uh, boats uh, on the lawn uh, through the weekend. 
and they, they build their own boat and launch it on on Sunday afternoon. Uh, typically, the boats are launched without paint, and um, and typically the families work uh, very full days right through the three days. And it's a phenomenal sight to see these people uh, just going at this construction full out, and um, and to to see this fleet of of boats launched. Are they building kit boats, Matt? Excuse me. Are they building a kit boat? Uh, they are. The boats are are are. Um, are kitted. Yeah. yeah. What what boats are they? Uh, well, there are a number of designs. Uh, they uh, build either a skiff um, or a, a kayak, or um, in the past we've had small double paddle canoes also. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that are, changes from from year to year. I see. Are they uh, are those Chesapeake light craft kits or? Uh, yes, they are. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or that they have some of them are. And, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So how many uh, how many families are involved in that? Uh, there are twenty or more. Wow! Very cool. And then, and often two or three members, or sometimes four members of a family working on a boat. Okay. And by the end of the three-day period, they get her in the water, huh? That's right. Yeah, as I said, <laughs> without paint, and so yeah. there's a little more work to be done. But it's a real boat. And, yeah. Uh, you know, there, there um, in the early days, there was a um, an event called Quick and Dirty Boat Building. And it was a great event. Uh, you had to build a boat to one's own design and um, as quickly as possible, get it in the water and race it on the water, um, sometimes with tools aboard in order to um, provide incentive for not sinking the boat. <laughs> and it was a lot of fun, and there was some great skill in it. But often you would finish the weekend, and there'd be um, a dumpster full of boats. Yeah, There weren't anything you'd want to take home. But these boats that the families build are boats that you want to take home and keep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very cool. And then I see you've got a section called I Built It Myself. I Built It Myself, right. It's, um, there are uh, more than 30 boats on the, the Village Green. That's a section of the seaport. And, um, and they are built by um, um, amateur, and I, I use the word amateur in the best possible sense, uh, but non-professional builders working at home and uh, readers of wooden boat. And uh, and they display their boats for the weekend, mm-hmm. and it's quite a variety. We had a um, a strip planked um, pontoon boat, very interesting, uh, comfortable looking boat. Uh, a few years ago, uh, kayaks, outboard skiffs, sailboats. Uh, it it really covers the spectrum of wooden boats. Have you had any shanty boats at that? We have. Um, okay. Harry Brian, a um, uh, one of Wooden Boat's contributing editors and a um, uh, boat builder from New Brunswick built a shanty boat a few years ago and displayed it at the show. Yeah, which is kind of a, a live-on, kind of a rectangular boat, right? That's right, rectangular, but with subtleties. I mean, there, mm-hmm. if you look at the, the boat in plan view, it's uh, it's curved, and um, this, it's not just a flat barge. It's, there's a, a nice, pleasing shear to the hull. And then on that is built a, a cabin, which also has a nice um, sweeping curve to the roof line. Yeah. And, um, so Harry's last name is pronounced Brian. That's right. Okay. That's good for me to know because I always say Brian. You know? <laughs> I think he'll answer to either. Yeah. And he's in Canada, right? He is. New Brunswick, Canada. Yeah. Does he, take, he, does he usually come to the show? He does, yeah. He'll be at large this year. I don't think he'll have a, a display this year, but mm-hmm. uh, but he will be there on Friday. Yeah. Now, are there opportunities for people to get out on the water on some of these boats during the show? There are. Um, and uh, there, there's a livery at Mystic where um, one can, can um, rent a small sailboat or a, um, or a rowboat. And there's also a number of boats being demoed on the, meaning demonstrated. On the, <laughs> yeah, not demoed. <laughs> That's right. A <laughs> demolition, huh? <laughs> right. Being demonstrated from the uh, the beach. There's a small beach at Mystic uh, Seaport, and um, and there are um, a couple of um, stalwart exhibitors who I know every year take uh, take interested parties out on their mo- their boats, uh, little motor boats and sailboats. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So for those listening that don't know what a livery is, tell us what that is, Matt. 
Well, uh, it's um, it's simply a rental, a boat rental, uh, and there was a, a tradition um, at one time of of being able to rent um, little rowboats in in coastal areas and on lakes, um, and that's pretty much uh, dried up, no doubt for liability reasons, as a commercial enterprise. Uh, but Mystic has a traditional livery where um, you can use a traditional boat. Very cool. I like that word livery. You just don't yeah, hear do it that it's often. A, it has a ring to it. Yeah, kind of like chandlery. And I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that right. but You are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is there a chandlery there at Misty? There is a chandlery. Yeah, there's a um, one of their buildings is a, a chandlery building. Yeah, so tell us what that is, Matt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is a chandlery? Yeah. Well, it sounds like Jeopardy game, right? <laughs> that's a nice way, a fancy way of saying marine hardware store. <laughs> okay, very cool. I should mention one other event, too. We're talking about being on the water. And um, SCUA races, uh, SCUA, or cocktail class is another name for it. Uh, there was a, a family in um, Wooden Boats Orbit who who took this um, this. Charles McGregor design from the rudder and adapted it uh, for their own use. And the, these are little outboard boats. They're, um, gosh, I think they're eight or nine feet long, uh, powered by small outboard motors. But they feel like three-point hydroplanes because they're so small and you're so close to the water in them. And uh, they'll be racing on Saturday afternoon. It'll be a pretty big fleet of them. So a couple of questions now. So Rudder is a magazine that ceased being published in what, like the 60s or 70s? Uh, that's right. Maybe actually late 70s or the even late, early 80s. I don't yeah. recall yeah. exactly what year it went out, but, it, um, but there it were, was a shadow of its former self by the time it did. Yeah, and that was a magazine that had boat plans and all kinds of marine stuff in it. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. 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 And then, yeah. In fact, I would say in, in some ways, um, Wooden Boat Magazine uh, really follows the rudder tradition. I see. Yeah. And then SCUA is S K U A. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned Chesapeake Lightcraft earlier. They they um, have kitted this boat. So if your listeners are interested in seeing what it's all about, that would be a an efficient way to find out is to go to the CLC website, Chesapeake Lightcraft website. Yeah. And um, and have a look at the the SCUA plans. Right. Okay. And then, uh, what kind of speed do those boats go, Matt? Do you know? Oh. Yeah, it, it it's hard for me to judge. I have raced them, um, yeah. but I I haven't measured the speed. But I'd say they're doing um, uh, fifteen or so. Okay, but when you're uh, that close to the water on a small boat, it probably feels like fifty. Exactly, um, and the, they're probably going a little bit faster than that, maybe fifteen to eighteen. But like you said, it feels like a lot faster than that mm-hmm. by a factor of ten. <laughs> yeah. And do they uh, do they turn very precisely and sharp, kind of like a... No. <laughs> oh, they don't? All. That's, oh, that's really? the skill of it. They go sideways. They, they, um, oh, they have really? virtually no lateral plane. <laughs> and so you, you, that's the strategy, is to um, slow down on the turns and um, and to not try to make a hairpin turn around a mark, because you'll you'll just keep going sideways. <laughs> really interesting. Yeah, so you're really going to line it up for the mark. So they really drift when you turn, huh? They do, yeah. Fun. So do you have one of those boats yourself? I don't, no. No, okay. No, I'm content to race one once a year. Okay. Uh, but I, I, I think it's the kind of thing that if one had a critical mass of friends or family members, that it would be hard to avoid having one. Yeah. Now, those have small outboards on them? That's right. Yeah, like, what, 10 horse or 15 horse? or? Uh, they're under that. I, I think oh, they're really? more in the, um, the, the 5 to 8 range. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. That sounds really fun. It's very fun. Yeah. How many boats are in a race, typically? Uh, well, the ones I've been in had um, four or five. Mm-hmm. But I think we'll have more this year because mm-hmm. they're, it's become pretty popular. Yeah. Very cool. And especially with the CLC kit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So for somebody that's uh, new to wooden boats, Matt, and they want to come to the show, what, what, do, you, what do you suggest they do first? Or what things should they not miss? Well, they should definitely subscribe to Wooden Boat Magazine the minute they get there. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, we, uh, and, and come by, seriously, come by the uh, Wooden Boat editorial booth. Uh, we, we have a, a booth set up just for, for readers to answer questions and where they can browse back issues. Uh, 
but I suppose it depends on what sort of book that person's interested in. Uh, but there are there are all sorts of resources for beginners. There, there are um, other book vendors. Uh, there are there are material suppliers. So if they're interested in building, the, the um, there's um, wood for sale at the seaport, for example. Uh, there are fastening suppliers and hardware, uh, epoxy vendors. Uh, so I would, um, you know, a, a, to, to suggest an entry point is, is difficult, but I would say get a copy of the program. Go to the information booth, get the program, and, um, and peruse it carefully and, mm -hmm. um, and, and draw a map of the show for yourself. Mm -hmm. Okay, very cool. So, Matt, do you have a personal favorite boat that's going to be at the show this year? Oh wow, that's a that's a good question, and that's <laughs> that's a hard one because I've, I've just got such a range of interest in boats. Yeah, what would be some of the ones that you like the most, though? Maybe. Well, I mentioned Bolero earlier, mm -hmm. and she is a, a favorite of mine. She's just a gorgeous boat. A, um, like I said earlier, she's a Sparkman and Stevens yawl, uh, and built by Henry Nevins in 1949, and uh, 51 foot waterline yawl and. Uh, and she just recently rolled out of the shop after a couple of years of rebuilding, and it's just gorgeous. Mm -hmm. Now, a yawl has two masts, is that right? That's right, two masts, and the after mast is smaller mm -hmm. and stepped behind the rudder post. Mm -hmm. And with that, with that sail that far aft on the boat, you get you get a lot of control over the boat, right? You do, yeah. Yeah, I have a yawl myself. Oh, do you really? Yeah, and I, I specifically sought out a yawl for that reason because it, it does make the boat very maneuverable in, in tight quarters. Yeah, because you basically you can control both ends of the boat, unlike a sloop where you're mainly you're controlling the front of the boat. That's right. The um, the, the yawl gives you a um, the, the mizzen on the yawl gives you just a, a or, or quite a bit of maneuverability of the stern. You're, you're able to kick it around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very cool. And also, it, it makes for a um, a good riding sail in some conditions. And by riding sail, I mean if the, the boat is at anchor or on a mooring, you could leave it up, and it, it keeps, uh, in theory, keeps the boat. Um, um, sort of weather veined into the wind. Oh, I see. Very cool. So, what's your what's your yawl that you've got? Yeah, it's um, much smaller than Bolero. It's a, okay. a thirty four footer designed by Aggie Nielsen. Okay, it's called Navigatrix. Okay, so is that your main boat that you keep in the water and you use quite a bit? Or it is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and she's a she's a plank on frame boat, Carvel planked. That's right. She's Carvel planked, um, double planked mahogany and cedar on oak. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So, um, if somebody wants more information about the show, Matt, what's the best way to get that? Uh, to visit our website, um, and that's www.woodenboat.com. Okay, and on the home page, there is a banner there for the show, probably. Yes, there is. Yeah. Okay. What's the cost for a three-day pass, Matt? Uh, the price for a ticket is um, is uh, well there's a it, it depends on who you are <laughs> oh, okay but yeah I, age and all that stuff that's right but for a um, right a, a three day ticket um, you can purchase a three day ticket uh, at woodenboat.com or excuse me at the woodenboatshow.com uh, through June 28th and adults are $30 mm -hmm. and kids um, from 6 to 17 are $15 and kids under five are free. And also Mystic Seaport members get in for free. Okay, very cool. And after the 28th, uh, one can purchase tickets at the gate. Would, would you like the gate pricing, too? That's sure, yeah. That's a little yeah. bit different from what you I just told that. you. that, yeah. Uh, senior citizens are $22, adults $24, and youth are 15 and again, that's ages 6 to 17, and kids under five are free. Okay, very cool. Yeah, and, and again, and, this is all at uh, thewoodenboatshow.com. Okay, thewoodenboatshow.com. Very cool. Anything else you'd act, like to add about the show, Matt? Uh, just that it's it's going to be a great time. I've been uh, going to wooden boat shows for over 20 years now, and I never get tired of them. Yeah. 
So I'm just curious, when you go down there, does it feel like work or does it feel like play or both? <laughs> uh, I would say it feels like, like both. I mean, there's, yeah. uh, I, mean we, I, I love what I do. And so it's, um, there's really no clear division between the two, between yeah. the work and play. So. Yeah. I'm pretty jealous, man. I'd actually like a job at the magazine there. If you could submit my resume for me, (laughs) (laughs) I would appreciate it. Put in a good word. (laughs) Well, you're doing a great job, too. (laughs) Oh, very fun. Well, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to be on the podcast today, Matt. And um, like I said, I hope to get out there to the East Coast next year or the year after and do a big tour and go to the show and Mystic and visit Brooklyn and all the places in between there. A lot of really fun stuff happening back there, it sounds like. There is, and we, we hope to see you out there. Um, come see us in the summer. It's just a beehive of activity at, at the Wooden Boat Campus. The yeah. school has just started, and, um, and it, it really is an interesting place. And uh, we'd love to have you out for a tour of the shops and, and a sale. Yeah. Any other cool stuff happening at Wooden Boat Magazine these days? Uh, well, the the um, as I mentioned, the, the school itself is um, is just has a tremendously loyal following, and um, and that has just started up. And there's always something interesting happening happening there. Yeah, and how long are the courses in the school? Uh, they're one week, one, uh, week. one week and two week, but typically one week. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, although some people will sign up for multiple courses and spend a good part of the summer there. And you probably have a lot of different topics on boat building and technique and exactly all that I kind mean, of stuff. Of, yes, um, and they range from uh, diesel engine repair. The, the uh, class is actually called "Making Friends with Your Diesel Engine," and I took that myself a few years ago, and that's um, that, that that was really a, a great primer on uh, on diesels and and what a, an owner should know uh, about his or her engine. Yeah. Um, and through to uh, Fundamentals of Boat Building, uh, which is a, a real solid grounding in, in traditional boat building, uh, strip planked kayak and canoe building. Uh, we even have a course in making your own bronze signal cannon. Bronze signal cannon. Wow. Yeah. In which, and this is a cannon that fires. <laughs> really? And that's right. The, um, yeah. the students turn their own barrels for these cannons and, uh, and, and do their own uh, carriage wooden carriage for them fun very cool so matt how many boats do you personally have or is that a top secret question no that's not top secret it's um <laughs> <laughs> i'm holding the line at seven right now oh really yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i know about the y'all quickly tell me the other six that you've got uh one is a um a custom runabout that um that i knew when i was 10 years old and in uh, the boat was in marblehead and it was built by an old friend and his son called me for advice on, um, he, he was just looking to, um, to, to sell it um, years ago now, and, um, and we came to pretty quick terms, <laughs> because I'd really fallen in love with the boat as a kid. And, oh, wow. Uh, and so that's a 23-foot runabout. Um, I built one of Harry Bryan's um, wheelbarrow prams several years ago. Okay, I've seen those, yeah. And that's a great boat. We, uh, we live close to a rocky beach here, and... Um, here on the coast of Maine, and um, the only easy access is to haul a dinghy up and down the beach. So this is a perfect boat for that. Yeah, it literally works like a wheelbarrow, right? It works like a wheelbarrow. You you take out the oars and um, and slide the handles through two holes, the, the the oar loom through two holes in the transom, and then the um, the oar handles become the wheelbarrow handles. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, a strip plank kayak, which is um, an Endeavor 17, and I, I built that when I was editing Ted Moore's book uh, called Kayak Craft on, on building strip plank kayaks. And um, my excuse was that it was a, a um, sort of live way of vetting the instructions, but I also wanted a, a nice kayak. So, mm-hmm. And Ted is a wonderful builder. Uh, has really um, raised the art of strip plank building to, um, to high art and <laughs> Um, it has a very refined technique, which he passed along really well in that book. Mm-hmm. Cool. Uh, another one is, <laughs> shall I keep going? Yeah, um, yeah. A 10-foot Old Town dinghy, which uh, when I was a kid was in my grandfather's basement. And I think it had come with the purchase of a um, an ACF motor cruiser when um, 
well before I was born, in the maybe in the fifties, the early fifties, and uh, and that had just sat in his basement, and um, somehow it became uh, it, it became mine. <laughs> wow! And uh, that's awaiting a new canvas, but that's, yeah, that's kind of storage for a while. Fun. And the rowing show, which I mentioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What are we up to? Uh, five or six. Right. Okay. Um, oh, and I, I think we're at six or seven. Okay. It's okay. A, um, one of Doug Highland's beach pea uh, pea pods. It's a plywood pea pod. Uh, we have um, two boys, my wife and I, and. Uh, and realized we had an inadequate dinghy situation um, when when our family started growing, and this is the perfect tender for a family the size of ours. It's a 13-foot glued lap plywood pea pod, and by glued lap I mean that it's um, it's built from plywood that's glued together rather mm -hmm. than mechanically fastened with rivets or, or rivets or screws. Yeah, and um, so it it can sit out of the water for a while without drying out and opening up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it look. rose very, excuse me? It's a traditional lap strake look. That's right, traditional lap strake look, but without frames. Yeah. Uh, so it's very easily cleaned and it rose easily, but carries a, a really good load of people and gear. Yeah, very cool. And that's a double-ended boat. It is, yeah. And a true double-ender. Uh, the great thing about these pea pods is rather than having two rowing stations, if you're rowing alone, you, um, you row the boat forward, you add a passenger in the stern, you, um, you shift to an after seat, turn around, and row in the other direction. Oh, really? And the boat maintains trim, right? Oh, nice. Cool. Yeah, actually, I interviewed Doug here recently, and he was talking about how he learned to, I think he learned building the pea pods from uh, somebody when he was a younger person and kind of took that and did his own design. So that's really awesome. Yeah, Doug has a great eye. And, yeah. uh, he's restoring a, um, you asked about other interesting things in our orbit right now. Yeah. He's restoring a, um, an R boat, a Hodgson built R boat called Penobscot at the moment. Oh, wow. And I'm pretty sure that um, you can follow progress on his website, mm -hmm. which I think is dnhylandboats.com. Okay. Um, but just to be sure, uh, Google uh, Doug Highland Boat and. Uh, You'll find your way to his site and yeah. I think some, some great photos of that project. And Highland is spelled H Y L A N, I think. That's right. Not Highland. Yeah. But Highland. Highland. Yeah. As you said, H Y L A N. Exactly. Well, very cool, Matt. I appreciate your time today. It's been really fun chatting. And uh, for anybody listening uh, that wants to go to the, can make it to the boat show, Mystic, man, it would be awesome. Go for it. And I'm going to try to make it next year. And, um, Thanks for your time, Matt. Any other comments you'd like to make? Uh, we look forward to, to having you out at, at Brooklyn some year, Dan. Come see us. Okay, very good. All right. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Matt. Thank you. Okay, take care. Right, bye. Okay, Matt, thanks for taking the time to do that interview. That was a blast. You've got a really cool history of sailing and boating and boat building. And I am really jealous that you work at Wooden Boat Magazine. <laughs> In fact, did you receive my resume yet to forward on to the hiring person there? I think I'd like a job there, Matt. <laughs> anyway, thanks again for doing that interview. That was really cool. I've actually got an upcoming interview I'll be playing here in the next couple of weeks with Pat Lown of Woodmoat Magazine, who's the director of the research. So you'll want to tune in again for that in a couple of weeks. So let's see what else here. You can connect with me via email. Dan at hookedonwoodenboats.com. Subscribe to my newsletter, hookedonwoodenboats.com forward slash subscribe. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest if you look for Wooden Boat Dan. Although I just found out yesterday that I somebody had tweeted to me and I didn't respond. I don't think I have my notifications set up correctly, so I'm not a big Twitter nerd type of guy, but uh, I'm going to try to get that fixed anyway. If you'd like to support what I'm doing financially, if you go to my homepage, actually any of the pages, you'll see banners on the right-hand side for Amazon, Jamestown Distributors, West Marine, Bluehost, which is a website hosting company, 
If you click on any of those banners and you go, that'll take you to their websites. And if you make any kind of a purchase, uh, I get paid a small commission. I would really appreciate that. Also, if you would uh, subscribe to the podcast, you can do so by going to iTunes, to the podcast section of the store, and uh, search for Hooked on Wooden Boats there, and you can click on the subscribe button. And also, I'd really appreciate it if you'd leave me a review. So far, I've got 39 five-star reviews, which is really cool. I would love to get a review from you. If there's ways you think I can improve the show, please note there and uh, give me the appropriate number of stars that you think I deserve, and I would really appreciate it. Well, that's it for today, folks. As you know, this podcast is about getting in the wooden boat game. If you're not in, it's time you get the little toe in the water of the wooden boat game. And the quickest way to do that would be to get on the Internet and start looking at some wooden boat sites, including Hooked on Wooden Boats. Or go buy a wooden boat magazine, go build a boat, go rent a boat, borrow a boat, go buy some lumber. Go to the lumber yard and buy some lumber and put it together into a boat. (laughs) Have some fun with it. It's a great pastime, great community of people, and it's a very rewarding experience. So check it out when you get a chance. Have a great week, folks. Keep the bright side up and the barnacled side down. Wooden boat Dan over and out. God bless.